Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another important lecture. Today we are studying the Aplanation Tonometry. In the previous video, we discussed about the indentation tonometry and its prototype that is the Schiotz tonometer. Here we shall discuss about the Aplanation tonometer. The Aplanation tonometer or instrument that basically measures the force which is required to flatten a small standard area of the cornea. So the term Aplanation basically means creating flattening effect on the cornea using some amount of force uh, using the tonometer. In this picture, you can see the difference between indentation and aplanation. In indentation, as the name suggests, we were actually creating a dent or a depression inside the cornea using a specific force of the tonometer, specifically the Schiotz tonometer that we discussed. And based on the force applied, we were calculating the intraocular pressure. However, in aplanation, you can see the aplanation is not creating any localized depression. However, it is actually causing flattening effect on the particular area on the cornea using a certain amount of force, right? So once we know this force to aplanate or flatten a particular area of the cornea, we can calculate the intraocular pressure. So that's the basic difference between aplanation and indentation. In aplanation, we are flattening the cornea, whereas in indentation, we are creating a depression. We are trying to depress the cornea using a certain amount of force. The aplanation tonometry is basically uh, based on the principle which is also called the Imbert Fix Law. The Imbert Fix Law says that if we consider a sphere which is filled up with fluid, the pressure inside that sphere is directly proportional to the force, which is represented by W, required to aplanate or flatten an area of A on that sphere. So consider this sphere and say the sphere is actually filled up with fluid. So the pressure which is present inside this fluid will be actually directly proportional to the weight that we apply or the force that we apply to flatten up area of A on this uh, fluid a sphere right so this gives the law as w is equal to p into a right so what will be the pressure the pressure or the intraocular pressure in this case will be force divided by area so weight over here is nothing but force as we go ahead in this lecture you will understand that we are actually calculating the weight that is required to aplanate a particular amount of area on the cornea and then we are divide uh, multiplying it with 10 to get the force right so the pressure is nothing but force divided by the area which is aplanated using that force and this is called the Imbert Fix Law, right? So this was an easy law. However, the law assumed a lot of things about cornea, okay? For this law to uh, function perfectly on a sphere, the sphere should be infinitely thin. That means the sphere should not have any amount of thickness to it. It should be perfectly elastic. That means it should be able to mold easily to our applanation. The sphere should be perfectly dry. It should not have any moisture to have any surface tension or capillary action. Moreover, it should be easily flexible. And the only force which is exerted upon that should be the force from the aplanating surface. However, does these points fit into cornea? No. In reality, none of these are true where it is applied to cornea. Okay, so cornea is not so perfect when we consider all these assumptions of the Imbert Fix law because cornea does have a thickness of about 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters. It is minimally elastic. Okay, so it is not very easy to depress or to flatten the cornea. Then moreover, as we know that cornea is not dry. Instead, cornea has a nice tear film on, at, on it, which keeps it wet. Okay, and that tear film imparts its a surface tension, which is called S. And this surface tension, uh, because of the capillary attraction of the tear film, will pull the tonometer towards the globe. Moreover, cornea is not that flexible also. It has corneal rigidity, which is also called the resistance to bending and is represented by the letter B. Now, in my previous video on indentation tonometry, I explained to you what is meant by corneal rigidity. So, therefore, the normal Imbert Fix law 
will not work for cornea as you can see this w is the amount of weight or the force that we are applying on the cornea to applanate an area of a and p is the pressure which is acting inside now the normal imbert fix law said that the weight will be equal to pressure into the area however here you can see that there are two more forces which are acting on the cornea one is the surface tension because the cornea has a tear film around it and that tear film will have a capillary attraction and because of that capillary action it is going to pull the tonometer towards the cornea so the surface tension is going to act in a downward direction along with the weight or the force that we are applying is also downwards to applanate the cornea Apart from that, you can see this B and B is nothing but it is the resistance to that bending which is offered by the cornea itself and it is also referred to as the corneal rigidity and the corneal rigidity is acting in a totally opposite direction, right? So this gives us the modified Imbert fix law which is W which is acting downwards surface tension which is also acting downward is equal to the pressure inside the sphere into the area of applanation plus the ocular rigidity which is acting upwards now pressure is also acting upwards so this is the modified imbert fix law for our cornea now what is the principle of applanation area now we know that the modified Imbert fix law is W plus S is equal to the P that is pressure into application area plus the ocular uh, rigidity. Now what if we were to simplify it further to get the normal Imbert fix law that is W is equal to P by A. So in order to get W is equal to P by A you have to cancel out the surface tension effect and cancel out this ocular rigidity as well. So how can we do that? Now scientists found out that on applanating an external corneal area of approximately 7.35 millimeters. So what I mean to say is we are applying a force or uh, using the tonometer on the eyeball or on the cornea and we are applanating a certain area. If this area is about 7.35 millimeters, it is seen that the effect of the surface tension and the corneal rigidity will diminish. That means at an area of 7.35 millimeters square of applanation, the surface tension and the rigidity will become equal to each other and will get cancelled out. And at that point, you are going to get W is equal to P by A. And therefore, it will become much more easier for us now to calculate the intraocular pressure by simply finding out the weight which is required to applanate this much area that is 7.35 millimeter square. So I hope that is clear. Moreover, at this applanation area, the force that you're going to apply to applanate the area, that is the force of say, for example, if you use a force of 0.1 gram, it will correspond to an IOP of one milligram. So whatever weight you uh, actually calculate or you get to applanate to uh, to applanate this amount of area that is 7.35 millimeters, that you have to multiply with 10 to get the intraocular pressure, right? So as I told you, the applanation area which is important here is 7.35 millimeters square and that comes to a diameter of applanation that is 3.06 millimeters, okay? So as we know that the area of a circle is pi r square, right? So uh, if you actually substitute into this the diameter by 2 because radius is half of the diameter and whole square, the total area that you get is 7.35 millimeters square. So if someone asks you what is the applanation area in Goldman tonometer, which is the prototype or in the applanation tonometer, it will be about 7.35 millimeters square and the diameter or the applanation area will be 3.06 millimeters, right? And then you already know the area, uh, you already know the area that you are applanating now you have to calculate the weight which is required to create the applanation area and whatever weight you find out you have to multiply it with 10 to get the desired IOP pressure. So what I mean to say is if you get 0.1 gram you have to multiply it with 10 the resulting pressure would be about 1 mm of Hg. If it is 0.2 you will get 2 mm of Hg. If it is 0.3 again you multiply it with 10 you will get 3 mm of Hg. That will be the intraocular. 
So finally, we uh, by balancing the surface tension and the ocular rigidity, we could actually use this Imbert fix law for calculating uh, for calculating the intraocular pressure within the eye. That is W is equal to P by P into A. That is force is equal to P into A. Now till now, whatever I discussed is actually one type of uh, applanation tonometry and in this type since the applanation area is not changing the applanation area is constant to about 7.35 millimeter square and what we are varying is the force to calculate the pressure this type of applanation tonometry is called a constant area applanation tonometry or a variable force tonometry uh, now there is another type as well in which the applanation area will be actually varying whereas the force that you use for applanating will be constant and that is called the constant force applanation tonometer. So what are the various types of applanation tonometers? We have the Goldman tonometer, the Perkins tonometer, the Dragger's tonometer, the McKay mug and tonopen tonometers, pneumatic tonometers, non-contact tonometers, the octuton tonometer and the Maclachau tonometers. Now there are so many tonometers, all of them working on the principle of applanation. However, the two most important ones are the ones which we'll be discussing on the channel. The first one is the Goldman tonometer, which is the prototype of the constant area applanation tonometer. And the other one is the Maclachau tonometer, which is a prototype for the constant force tonometer that means a variable area type of tonometer. The remaining tonometers are mostly the constant area type of tonometer similar to the working principle of the Goldman tonometer. Now let us talk about the Goldman's applanation tonometer also referred to as the GAT. Now the Goldman applanation tonometer was first introduced in 1957 by Hans Goldman and Theo Schmidt. It's actually a prototype of the constant area applanation tonometer. It comes in two designs. The first one which can be mounted from below or on the, uh, on the slit lamp is this one shown as and represented as number one. This particularly goes with the hat street type of slit lamps. And the second one which goes uh, well with the Zeiss one is actually mounted on top of the slit lamp and can be actually brought down whenever we want to do tonometry on the patient. So as you can see here, this is a hack street type of slit lamp and you can see the tonometer here mounted like this. So whenever the joystick moves forward, the tonometer also go, uh, goes forward and applanate the cornea of the patient in order to calculate the intraocular pressure. Whereas in the Zeiss type of uh, slit lamps, the tonometer is usually mounted, which is not mounted here in this picture, but this is a location where it is mounted and then it is brought down uh, to cause applanation onto the patient's cornea. There are various parts of the tonometer. You can see in this hack street type, this is the part which gets connected to the slit lamp. Then there is this applanation unit. Here we have this triangular structure which actually goes and applanates the cornea. And this uh, triangular structure actually houses two prisms and therefore it is also called a biprism unit. It is connected with the housing facility with an arm and that is called the feeder's arm. And then we have an important knob here, which is called the tension knob, also called the tension adjusting knob, with which we can actually vary the amount of force that we are going to use, the amount of weight that we are going to use to applanate the cornea. And this rectangular structure is called the housing unit, which has the various kinds of weight and the lever actions, which are uh, the levers which are present in this tonometer. Now, as you can see, this is how it is actually mounted on the slit lamp and the tonometry using Goldman is usually done in the cobalt blue filter light because we are going to stain the patient's eye using the fluorescent. So the cobalt blue filter is used and therefore you get this blue color light and the examiner is going to view from the binoculars, preferably it is actually a monoocular method because your prisms are going to be present on one side of the slit lamp and most of the slit lamp it is present on the right side and therefore the Goldman applanation tonometry is done using the left uh, uh, ocular of the slit lamp. So it's a monoocular technique not a binocular technique. So the examiner is going to view through one of the ocular directly through the center of this applanation unit or to the center of that biprism. So that is very important. 
this by prism as i told you it actually has these two prisms which are aligned in this way and the function of this prism is to split the aplanating unit optically and in such a way that the area of aplanation will now be converted into two semicircles so if this is the by prism and this is the area of contact right since the by prisms anterior aplanation structure you can see it is circular so the area of contact between the by prism and the cornea will also be circular however this by prism has those two dissecting or uh, two splitting prisms which are present and these prisms are going to split this circle into two halves into two half semi circles right and these semi circles are going to look somewhat like this as shown over here similar this is what you actually see on the slit lamp this is the examiner viewing through one of the oculars straight through this by prism over here and these are the two semicircles that you're going to see okay and this is done under the fluorescent dye under the and the view uh, the examiner is viewing actually under the cobalt uh, blue we have to explain everything about the purpose of the test and about the procedure to the patient then the patient is also advised not to drink alcoholic beverages because they can affect the intraocular pressure at the same time not to drink lots of water just two hours before the test if the patient use contact lenses contact lenses also have to be removed then it, the procedure starts with staining of the intraocular surface using a moistened strip of fluorescein. Before that, we have to instill one drop of local anesthetic agent, preferably 0.5% proparacaine, and then you have to stain both the eyes uh, with a fluorescein strip. After that, the, is the slit lamp adjustment. The tension knob of the tonometer should be set at this one gram. Now this one gram is very important because any setting of the tension knob below one gram, that means about nearing to the zero, will cause excessive vibration of this tonometer and this can cause injury to the patient's corneal surface. So the setting on the tension knob is very important and it has to be set at about one gram. After that, make sure that the by prism which is present and here in the by prism you will have a white mark. That white mark should be properly aligned to this zero mark which is present on the by prism. Then the tonometry is actually done in the dim room. So dim the lights in the room. The angle between the illumination beam and the viewing system has to be kept at 60 degrees. And as we have stained the patient with fluorescein, a cobalt blue filter is to be used with the slit beam open maximally. The patient has to be seated comfortably with the height of the slit lamp and the chair and the chin rest, all of them adjusted so that the patient is comfortable. The head, the forehead is supported against this headrest. The chin is on the chin rest. And then the examiner will slowly advance the feed around which is carrying the by prism towards the patient's cornea. The tip of the prism will be very gently touched. So here, by our mechanical force, we are not uh, giving any force to the cornea, okay? The force should not be given using the mechanical movement of the prism. Here, the force will be provided by the tension knob. So all that you have to do is gently take the prism near the patient's corneal surface till it very gently touches the cornea. And make sure that the lids are not touched nor the lashes are touched. Then... A monocular view through the left binocular of the slit lamp is obtained uh, of the central aplanated zone of the cornea. So the force of the aplanation is in this direction as mentioned by the uh, over here with an arrow. Now using the joystick the observer has to raise, lower or center the assembly until two equal semicircles are seen in the center of the field of view. So the application surface is circular and as you can see through the by prism, the examiner is actually looking through this prism through the left ocular of the slit lamp and he is going to see these two semicircular arcs. Now the joystick can be moved up and down. The slit lamp assembly unit uh, which is actually carrying this um, applanating probe can actually be moved up and down using the joystick and it has to be done in such a way so that the and the superior uh, semicircle and the inferior semicircle they should be equal in their sizes the fluorescent rings also should be having a proper size of about 0.25 to 0.30 millimeters in thickness and this is about 1 by 10th of the diameter of the flattened area 
the lashes should not be touched there should be no blinking or squeezing during the procedure because that can artificially raise the intraocular pressure the circle should be of pre uh, of appropriate size if you get big circles it means that the instrument is too far forward onto the patient cornea if you get very small circle that means that the instrument is too far away from the eye and you have to move a little bit closer to the patient if you get very thicker amount uh, thicker uh, semicircles that means that probably the patient has too much fluorescent in the eye and in this case you need to blot the eyelids carefully with a tissue and sometimes even the front surface of the prism should be dried with a lint free material then sometimes you will get very narrow uh, circles and that means that the fluorescent the amount of fluorescent in the patient eye is inadequate or due to the long testing procedure uh, there might be uh, drying up of the tear film so as you can see, we should get this appropriate amount of circle. In the first picture, you can see the, the semicircles are quite thick. That means excessive fluorescent is present. In the second picture, the semicircles are very narrow in their thickness. That means this is because of drying up of the cornea or inadequate fluorescent in the patient's eye. In the third picture, you can see the upper and the lower semicircles, they are not uh, correctly, uh, they're not equal in size. In this case, you can see the lower semicircle is much more greater in size compared to the upper semicircle. So whenever a condition like this arises, you have to move the slit lamp assembly unit towards the larger circle. So in this case, in this case you can see the inferior semicircle is larger than the superior so you have to move your joystick or the slit lamp downward towards the uh, bigger semicircle in such a way or till you can get this equal semicircles the tension knob is then going to be rotated until the inner borders of the fluorescent rings touch each other at the midpoint of their pulsations so for example you can see that this is the inner margin of the semicircle similarly here this is the inner margin of the inferior semicircle so the inner margins have to touch at one point and till the inner margins touch you are going to keep on rotating the tension knob increasing the amount of tension right so at a point when the inner margins of the superior and the inferior semicircles will just come in contact with each other that is the point where the applanation is completed and that is the point where the applanation area of 3.06 uh, diameter or 7.35 millimeter square area is actually achieved so that is the end point of tonometry right the prisms are actually calibrated in such a manner that when the inner margins or the circles will just touch each other then the area of apprehension is 3.06 millimeter sorry so this is the di the the area is about 7.35 millimeter square and the diameter of the apprehension is about 3.06 millimeters now as you can see here the inner margin of the superior circle and the inner margin of the inferior semicircle is just in touch to each other and this is the end point similarly here you can see the inner margins are just getting aligned to each other in this end point so let's understand this in this first picture you can see that the outer margin is actually aligned with the outer margin of the inferior uh, semicircle so in this case what you will do is you will actually increase or you will rotate the tension knob to increase the amount of force so that they move closer together so that the rings will have to move closer together so from one we have increased it to about two now in this picture you can see that both rings are actually aligned very well however you have to again in this case increase the tension knob and move them further uh, further closer such that only the inner margins will just touch that means this line over here and the inner margin of the inferior semicircle they are supposed to touch and not the entire uh, thickness of the mire what about this case in the third case you can see they have actually moved too closer and in this case you have to actually decrease down the tension on the tension knob so the final correct position or the end point is when the inner margins of the superior semicircle and the inner margin of the inferior semicircle will just uh, uh, close will just touch each other and at that point the diameter of apprehension will be 3.06 millimeters and the area will be 7.35 millimeters square so such in this way 
three successive readings have to be taken within one mm of Hg difference, right? And the reading that you get in grams should be multiplied by 10 and that will give you the intraocular pressure in millimeters of mercury. This value is to be recorded along with the date of the test, the time of the day at which the test is performed and the list of ocular medication which the patient has used. Along with that, you should also record the last uh, time, the last insulation time of the ocular medication. So, Goldman apprehension tonometer is also not free from error. It gives erroneous reading in thin corneas and very thick corneas as well. Whenever this astigmatism greater than three diopters, then also we get erroneous reading. Inadequate fluorescence will give narrow, uh, narrow rings or narrow mires, and that can also cause as a source of error. Too much fluorescence will give us wider mires. Irregular gonias will give us irregular mires. Sometimes the tonometer can go out of calibration and then we can get a false reading. Make sure that the patient is always looking straight ahead because if the eyes are elevated to more than 15 degrees, sometimes the pressure can rise. And sometimes if we are performing tonometers too many times, that is called repeated tonometry, then also we can get uh, low intraocular pressure readings. Make sure that you never press on the eyelids, nor does the patient squeeze the eyeballs because then uh, what happens is the pressure is going to raise. The appropriate position to place your um, thumb and the index finger is on to the orbital rim and not on the patient's eyelid. Sometimes observer bias can also be present like expectations or some even numbers. People are biased towards even numbers and then also we can get various erroneous readings. Another uh, greater disadvantage of the Goldman's apprehension tonometer is that it depends on the central corneal thickness. If there's a thinner cornea, uh, thinner corneas, they need less apprehension force. And therefore, if you are using the less apprehension force, the IOP reading will also be underestimated or falsely low. Whereas in thicker corneas, because the cornea is thick, it needs much more apprehension force and that will lead to falsely high estimation of the intraocular pressure. The Goldman tonometer will give you the accurate reading only when the CCT, that is central corneal thickness, is of about 520 microns. Any deviation of from this 520 microns corneal thickness will cause the deviation of the intraocular pressure by about 0.5 millimeters of Hg, that is mercury, for every 10 microns deviation from this 520 microns limit. So the advantages are that it does not depend on the corneal rigidity. As I explained to you in the modified Imbert Fitz law, that here we are eliminating the surface tension as well as the ocular rigidity factor. So it does not depend upon the ocular rigidity. Moreover, it displaces very little fluid compared to that of the Schiotz tonometer. So in this way, it is a very good gold standard tonometer to which various other tonometers are also compared. However, the disadvantages are that the Goldman tonometer still depends on the corneal thickness as I explained you how the central corneal thickness can cause sometimes overestimation and underestimation of the intraocular pressure. Similarly, patients who have undergone refractive surgeries in which the cornea is artificially thickened or thinned or uh, made thin can also have altered or false intraocular pressure you are by the Goldman tonometer. Moreover, the Goldman tonometer is much more costly than the Schiotz tonometer. It is not easy to carry it, it is not portable and moreover it needs sterilization in between patients. Another question that is actually asked is how do you sterilize your Goldman tonometer? So it can be sterilized using uh, a soaking method in which you soak it in diluted sodium hypochlorite for about 5 to 15 minutes. You can use 3% hydrogen peroxide, 70% isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol. If all of those are not available, even 10 minutes of washing under running tap water or soap and water and sometimes even disposable tonometer tips are available which can be changed in between the patients. However, disposable films are not so effective and they do not give proper amount of protection against the prions disease. So that's all for, uh, for today. Thank you and have a nice day.